Now, I'm joined in studio by Julie Lalonde, the author of a brand new book called Resilience is Futile, The Life and Death and Life of Julie S. Lalonde. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Now, uh, before we begin, I I just wanted to let listeners know that uh, I think today's discussion is important, but also very heavy. And we're going to be talking about violence against women in particular. So if you're not in a space for that, we totally understand. So to jump right into it, in addition to being an author now, you're a consultant, an award-winning one, I should say, (laughs) uh, who provides gender-based analysis and policy advice, as well as training on the prevention of violence against women. And the book touches on all of this, but really so much more. Uh, So for listeners who are not aware of your story, can you give us a summary of what this book is about? Resilience is Futile is a memoir about my experience of leaving an abusive relationship and being stalked for over a decade. Uh, And in the same time, living kind of a parallel life where I was doing very public and am doing very public work to end violence against women, which put a target on my back by misogynist groups, by online trolls, uh, by conservative politicians. So it's really the I had a public life and a very private life, and they were very separate until recently. And I wanted to expose the reality that there are women all over the world, in this country, in your neighborhood, in your family, who are living these things, and you just don't know it because we hide it really well. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on the book. I think it's a huge accomplishment. Thank Um, you. How are you feeling now that it's out? It's very surreal, and I get really excited and then right away scared. So uh, people have been very kind in tweeting pictures of them reading the book, pictures of their cats and dogs sitting with them while they read the book. Um, And, you know, I see it in a display at Octopus Books, and I get so excited. And then I turn and I think, oh, my gosh, all of my deepest, darkest secrets are in a window at Octopus Books. So So it's it's a really, a very surreal experience for sure Mm -hmm. octopus books is actually where i picked up my uh, hard copy the the cover is so beautiful i wanted to have the physical um copy did did you have a hand in the design i did not so ingrid paulson gets all of the credit for that the only thing i said was i didn't want it to feel true crime um because if you pick up the book you'll see that there's letters and notes and and kind of scrapbooky type things inside that they originally wanted to put on the cover but it felt too much like a true crime Mm -hmm. thing which i know sells right now but that's not the vibe at all of the book um and so i said otherwise go for it and it's very much my aesthetic (laughs) i love it so much um and i had no say so it feels very uh serendipitous to me that it came out so beautifully i should say i had a say but i had no input because i had no like that's just not how my brain works it was meant to be yeah it really was so the title of the book is resilience is futile and you write in it that my resilience was used to erase my pain it's it's a very powerful thought can you explain what you mean by that I actually came up with the idea that resilience was kind of a nonsense concept while I was doing my grad studies here at Carleton, where I was working to look at poverty amongst elderly women. That was kind of my thesis. That was really what I was. But what I discovered was that their resilience and capacity to kind of pull themselves up by their bootstraps is why their struggle was so invisible, um, because they had came from a generation of pride of you don't ask for help because you don't need help. But then because of that, you're not at the table to make policy decisions. You're not an election issue. um, And so your pain gets erased. And then in my case, the fact that, you know, a few months before I came out about my story of what happened to me with my ex, I was publicly taking on the military. I was calling them out for sexual violence. So people really thought, okay, how can you take on the Canadian Armed Forces, but you couldn't take on this like little pipsqueak of a boyfriend that you had? Like, I don't really, it doesn't really make sense to me. Or, wow, that sounds really heinous, but like, you seem fine. So it couldn't have been that bad. Um, And then it's just sort of this like interesting story, rather than a, a traumatic experience that forever changed who I am. And so I think women, we see that a lot. I think we see that a lot play out in courtrooms around sexual assault, where it doesn't even question whether or not he did it. It's like, but you kept talking to him, so you seem fine. You kept going to school. You, you partied the next day, so, like, you're fine. Um, so we see that play out a lot. Now, you talked about the women being from a time where they felt, you know, they, they you don't ask for help. And, and that's something we hear quite a bit, I find, with, with men now. There's that macho, like, I don't need help. Um, so it's interesting to hear that, you know, this is this is really a problem throughout society. This is not 
one group of people. This is everyone needs help, right? Yeah, and that I think it's a very white Western idea to, yeah, to like shove your emotions down to not be even if you look at the ways that you know western culture generally we're not as affectionate as other cultures like we very much have like stoicism and like putting up a wall we're very kind of cold in many ways um and but that isn't like i think that yeah plays into the fact that men are less likely to get access for mental health services um and that women in general feel like you know especially if you're maybe a mother or the head of your household you got to like keep it together for the sake of mm-hmm. everybody else um, and in my experience, that's absolutely, it was like, I got to keep it together because I don't want to worry my family. I don't want to worry other people. Um, and I'll just figure it out myself. Um, and I think we reward that in our culture. Like we really reward kind of individual, like bootstrapping, like I came from nothing and look at me now. And we don't talk about the structural issues. We just love to focus on kind of the individual person and look at how well they're doing. Um, and I think that's really destructive. You know, that's interesting. In the book, you talk quite a bit about sheltering other people in your life, your parents in particular, some your friends, about not burdening them with how bad this is for you at the moment. Um, do you think if you if this happened again, you would react the same way, or do you think you would now know that like I have these the support in my life that I I can use it. I don't need to keep them out of this. I it's a question I ask myself a lot, honestly, um, because it put me in this weird bind where when I came out about my story, I was really resentful that people weren't there for me. And then I had to stop and think, OK, but did they know how bad it was? So they didn't know to be there for me. So then I'm like, well, isn't that my fault? And then it's like, no, but am I blaming myself? Like, it's a weird loop a loop. And so I don't know if I would. I, I mean, I still feel um guilt and burdening people about the things that I'm going through. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I tweeted out about Kobe Bryant and I got half a million death threats. Um, police presence was at my house. I you know, had to flee my home and I completely downplayed it to maybe three people in my life because I didn't want people to be concerned. Um, so I think it's still a tendency I have to be like, your mess is a mess and stop making it everyone else's mess. And it's really hard for me to kind of fight that instinct. Well, if you have time later, I may want to touch on the Kobe Bryant <laughs> thing. But you were once asked by a talk radio host what deficiency you had that made your stalker target you. And and you said you weren't sure how to answer at the time. How would you answer now? Um, I definitely would have told him off when he said that to me instead of trying to be nice. Uh, <laughs> I do. I... I think it's so hard for me because as an advocate, my answer is always like predatory men will figure out what they want to figure out. And it's not about what you do or don't do. Um, But I do absolutely think that because I was raised and I don't know if it was Catholicism or being from a working class family where you had to really keep it together. I don't know. Um, But being prioritizing being nice and making sure that people are comfortable and happy um and over my own feelings is such an instinct for me and i think that's absolutely what um xavier saw which was like i was a kind person who was a people pleaser and that can easily be manipulated um if you don't have the backbone to stand up for yourself which i didn't have because i just always prioritized other people over my own gut Mm -hmm. um and so i think he knew that and he knew that because we were friends for years before we started dating. So he knew everything about me, which means he could figure out, okay, what things can I tweak and buttons can I push? Yeah. 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 Now, the writing in the book is is very accessible. Uh, so it's not heavy even when the subject matter is. So how much effort did you put into finding that balance? Uh, I didn't really. Um, so one, I mean, that's such a compliment. So thank you. And two... It's this is the only time in my life, in my career anyways, that that's been to my advantage. Um, even when I was in grad school, I constantly got told that my writing wasn't considered technical enough. It wasn't theoretical enough. Like literally at one point, someone on my committee said that my writing was too accessible. Uh, and, you know, being the first person in my family to go to university, I was like, that's a point of pride for me that like my work resonates with everyday people. So this was so freeing to be able to treat it like who I am and how I write, which is just conversationally. Um, and that's my passion, like taking complicated concepts 
even things like rape culture. I mean, we talk about it all the time now, but a few years ago, people were like, help me understand. That doesn't make sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's my skill set is taking complicated stuff and making it bite-sized um, and accessible. So the fact that I keep hearing people say, oh, it feels like I'm just having a conversation with a friend. To me, that's just such a compliment because that's exactly what I wanted to convey. Mm -hmm. So I'm speaking with Julia Lalonde about her, uh, her new book, Resilience is Futile. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's so many people who might find reading about your experience, it brings back their own trauma. And I imagine you know this better than anyone. So I'm curious if that affected how you wrote the book and how you presented your story. I'm a big believer in buyer beware. So the book has kind of an intense title for a reason. Um, we intentionally put blurbs and reviews that talk about how it's intense. Um, so people kind of know that going in. Um, so I always try to strike a balance because I think shying away from things because they're too triggering is how we got into this mess in the first place. Um, but there's definitely stories I didn't share. There's definitely details that I skipped over if I felt... <clears throat> that it was just too intense um, and that I would make the point in another way instead. So mm -hmm. that's really how I balanced each of the kind of scenes in the book was like, okay, what lesson is this teaching the reader? If I do it once, I feel like I don't need to do it over and over again, which is also why I kept the book very short because um, I didn't want people to sit in those feelings for hours and hours and days and days. I really wanted to make the point and then kind of propel people forward. Right. So I, I mostly interview musicians being a music show. <laughs> But there's a question I, I often have for them that I feel also applies to you. So musicians frequently write about painful experiences and say it's a cathartic experience to do so. Um, there are a few, though, who find it too hard to sing those songs night in and night out, essentially reliving their pain. So I'm wondering if writing this book has been cathartic for you. Writing it was not cathartic finishing it was so seeing it complete seeing it um you know because I was doing the work of healing as I was writing this book because it was the first time I was forced to look back on everything and look at it chronologically as well like I had to you know kick it old school and I had all these things on little note cards and I was sticking them up on the wall and trying to figure out because trauma impacts your memory in a big bad way so there are timelines that were completely messed up that I didn't realize until I looked through things um so that process was excruciating um I think at one point in the book I refer to it as like excavating my bones and like that's what it felt like uh but then to be done and then to look at it one was like okay you have the right to write this story because it it is a unique story in many ways and it needs to be told so that validation that I gave myself of like yes you're a white woman with a lot of privilege and a lot of um yeah a lot of opportunities but you're allowed to tell this story um and then to look at it and be like I survived everything that's in this book and then I survived writing it and that felt super cathartic to be like okay I still got this you know so now that you're doing interviews about it, how are you feeling considering that you've had to relive a lot of this? Is the, is the interview process like this challenging or is this part of the, okay, I'm closing sort of that, well, you're never going to close the chapter. That's not what I want to say, I guess, but you're sort of, you, you've accomplished this. Yeah, I actually find it easier to talk about than to read from, uh, which is, I didn't expect. And I think it's because my career is talking. I mean, I've spent the last 17 years giving presentations on violence against women. I've spent the last five years talking about my story. So, I mean, it's it's certainly more difficult to talk about this than it is my general, you know, consent one-on-one workshops. Um, but I find the act of actually like having to read from the book really difficult. And so I don't know if it's because I have to really concentrate in order to read, whereas when I'm talking, I can free flow. I don't know, um, but I get the most emotional reading from the book, even if it's a passage that's, I mean, there are some funny passages in it. Um, and even then I still feel like, oof, which I, I did not anticipate. So early in the book, when you decide to leave Xavier, who is, if you haven't read the book, that's your, your ex and your abuser. Uh, you mentioned a friend named Taylor mm -hmm. and, and, and how important their role was. Yeah. Can you talk about what they did to, to help you make this choice? Yeah. Um, so Taylor and I have been friends since we were 10. 
uh, and she ended up moving to Ottawa shortly after I did. And when I was living with Xavier, she actually lived in the apartment building across from my house. So we hung out like every day. She also went to Carleton. Um, so she kind of knew, even if I wasn't explicitly talking about how awful Xavier was, she just could sense it because she knew me so well. Um, and so at one point it was after actually taking a group exercise class here at Carleton, I was driving her back home and I said, I don't know if I'm just feeling fired up from class or what the deal is, but I think I'm going to do it. Um, and I think I'm going to break up with him. I think I'm going to do it. And I, re I vividly remember sitting in my car and her saying, okay, okay. And that was my first time saying it out loud to someone, let alone to myself. And her reaction of being supportive was so good. But then the she followed it up with like, and if you don't, like if you, it's too scary or you can't do it, like that's okay. You can try again. You can do it another time. And it just makes me so emotional even thinking about it. Like it was just such a gift that she gave me. And like, I have to also remind myself and people like she was 20 years old. Like I was 20 years old, right? She didn't, she wasn't in social work. She didn't have a social work background. Like it was just her instinct to say like, Hey, my understanding is that this stuff is hard. And if you screwed up once, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't do it again. And like, it was such a gift because I wasn't able to do it. Yeah. I did quote unquote chicken out and I was able to go back to her and know that I hadn't disappointed her. Yeah. And it, that's an important distinction, right? Yeah. It's not pressuring you to do what's probably the right thing, but being there for you so you can get through it. Totally. And I tell that story in every presentation that I do to people, because I'm like, just if it's the only thing you remember, like, just keep a door open for people because you've it's so humiliating to be in an abusive relationship and to know, quote unquote, what the right thing is and to not be able to do it. You feel like such a disappointment. And so, yeah, having someone be like, girl, it's OK. It was like, whew, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you said I'm just trying to find the line here, but essentially that she saved your life. And and that was maybe one of the most powerful parts of this whole book for me was reading that and understanding why. You yeah. Know, just like you talked about. And also just like it it really is that simple. Like people, you know, I talk about bystander intervention. I talk about how to be there for survivors and people are like, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a psychologist. I can't do this. This is too much. This is too scary. I'm like. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, like it, it literally is as, as simple as just having empathy to recognize, wow, it's probably really hard to leave an abusive relationship. Then you add in that you live together, all of the complexities of that, like to just have an empathy to say like, wow, that sounds really tough. I'm here for you can literally change someone's life. Like I like it really, truly can. And I absolutely believe that she set me on a path of being able to try again. Mm -hmm. And then I succeeded the second time. And I don't think I would have even tried had she not said that. And that's how small it was. This was like a 30 second conversation, you know? That's amazing. Yeah. So despite the seriousness of the subject matter, there are moments of levity in the book that to me, they almost serve as like a, a palate cleanser and, and ease some of the tension. Um, so your school ski trip was a good example. <laughs> Maybe tell us what happened and, and whether you've gone skiing since then. So. so the answer is no. I gave up on skiing in high school for this reason. Yeah, me um, too. <laughs> my school had this program where we would go to um, like boonies of Quebec basically and go skiing. Um, and I just really had a lot of confidence in my ability to do things <laughs> that I actually couldn't do very well. Um, and so, yeah, I like accidentally went down a double black diamond at one point. Cause I thought the more diamonds there were, the easier the hill that did not work out. So I like went down moguls, like on my bum, like just being like, what am I doing? Um, and then <laughs> later on, and I also was like kind of a sassy teenager, which I'm sure is unsurprising, but, um, I thought, okay, I can big the, I can do the big hill. And so I went up the ski lift, like a four person chairlift. Um, and when I got up, my binding got stuck. And so <clears throat> I was like trying to fix my ski. But if you, for those of you who ski, you know, when you get off the chairlift, you got to turn right away. Otherwise the chairlift keeps going. I kept going straight. I was like bent over trying to fix it. And then the guy was yelling at me like, madame, madame. And I thought he was just give like, you know, getting me in trouble because I was in the wrong place. And I got up to literally flip him off. And as I did... <laughs> a four person chairlift smoked me right in the face. Um, and so uh, all of my friends were like convinced I was dead. They called ski patrol. They're like, what is this woman doing? She's like trapped under a chairlift. It was. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's why I don't ski anymore. So when uh, they make a movie of your life, you'll need a stunt double. So absolutely. <laughs> like you cannot cut that out because it's just such an indication of who I am as a person. Um, yeah. So there's moments like that <laughs> in the book. Um, I tell like funny stories about my family. Uh, so I do try to, yeah, 
give people like the sorbet palate cleanse between the heavy. Yeah. Okay. So continuing with that, what is a confused boner? <laughs> Glad you asked. <laughs> so <laughs> the rule book, typically, if you're a feminist on the internet, is that people are going to call you uh, fat and ugly because that's just what they do. Um, maybe throw in like a slide if they're feeling particularly spicy, but generally you get a lot of like, you're fat, you're ugly, you're fat, you're ugly. Um, and I am neither of those things. And so, uh, and even saying that is considered like root or like, I don't know, cocky to say, but it's like, I'm objectively not a fat person and I used to work as a model. So I know I'm not hideous. So, um, so what happens is like, if there's a news article where I'm quoted, and there's no picture I get like she's fine she's ugly she's whatever and then if I'm quoted and there is a picture then I get this like weird like hypersexual like response and so I I kind of named it this like confused boner thing where like these people <laughs> hate me but then they're like oh but also she's hot like uh, uh, they just like can't and I think part of it too is because I don't look like a feminist stereotype that the internet loves to attack right so like i don't have blue hair or face piercings or like alternative style like i dress in a very feminine way and so i think that adds to this like confusion they have about like but but and they just don't know what to do with it and so i get a lot of the like she's crazy but i'd still hit it and you're like thanks (laughs) (laughs) yeah so i've dubbed it the confused boner i like that it's a good term (laughs) So the little bits of humor that are sprinkled throughout the book, were they intentional to lessen the heaviness? Or is that simply your personality poking through even during the chaos? I, I, it wasn't intentional in the sense that I was, it's just really how I conceived of telling the story. Um, Because even in my presentations that I talk about, people afterwards will say like, I laughed a lot more than I thought I would. Um, because it's such a heavy but it's like it's the only way i know to tell the story because i don't want to listen to someone just bum me out for two hours Mm -hmm. so it's important for me to infuse that but also just literally who i am as a person like i made jokes about things that were happening with xavier because it was healthy for me to just sort of look at it as like this guy is a clown like what is he even doing you know um and it's just who i am as a healthy coping mechanism yeah totally and also just because it was like it was just so objectively wild that you could kind of run with it um and so yeah in the book and looking at it i was like okay this does actually work because i also was concerned about offending people in in making a joke that they were like oh this is this is not appropriate you know so and looking back on it i feel like i didn't do that but um It's important to me to not just bum people out because I'm truly a sunshine rainbows kind of human being. So it's always this weird thing that my like when you see me on the news, you know, bad news is coming. But I'm like, but I'm not a bad news person. Uh, So that was important to me. I can objectively say that confused boner is hilarious. So (laughs) thank you. (laughs) So going back to the to music tie in for a moment, uh, I found over the, the decades of doing interviews that musicians love retreating to a cabin in the woods to Mm -hmm. write new material Mm -hmm. and you had the opportunity to do something similar in Banff so how did that opportunity present itself and and did it have a tangible effect on what you wrote I absolutely would not have written a book if I didn't get to go to the Banff Center so absolutely and you know your tax dollars pay for the Ontario Arts Council that allowed me to go to do that so thank you uh I knew that right I mean I was working full time when I was in grad school. So I knew I can write off the side of my desk if I need to. But I I felt like in order to really do this book justice and have it be honest, I needed to deep dive. And you can't deep dive into, you know, your extreme trauma and then just go back to doing your day job of violence against women. So I just thought, okay, I've never written stuff before. Like, I don't know, I'll just like throw it out there. And I applied to do a two week writing residency at the BAM Center. Um, and I got accepted twice. So I got to do a total of, I did two weeks in, uh, December. So it was like beautiful, snowy. I love it. Then I did another two weeks in the spring, um, last year and it was incredible. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, it was a truly magical experience and it absolutely is why this book is as honest as it is. And I think that it even exists in the world. Um, cause without that dedicated time, I would not have recovered. Mm-hmm. It's important. Yeah. So when Xavier died, you actually yeah. Woke- spoiler alert. People, yeah. He died. Sorry. <laughs> people, 
I blanked. I couldn't remember if we'd mentioned that in, in the no, recap okay. earlier on. So, it's on page one, so it's not. We're yeah, not ruining anything for but, you, people. I mean, that, that, that's an important part of of what happened here. So, you know, w- when Xavier died, you actually woke up and started hyperventilating at the same time it happens. It turns out, and you obviously didn't know that it had happened when you woke up. How do you explain that? I don't know, and it is freaky deaky to me because I am not a like bula bula hippy dippy kind of person. Um. But if it wasn't someone else saying like, no, 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 you woke up and we're like, I wouldn't have believed it myself. Uh, I mean, I talk about trauma bond in the book. Trauma bond is a very real concept. And so I don't know if that's what it was, like that something was going on that we were that bonded that the moment he died, I shot out of a dead sleep. Um, But it gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Like it's wild. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like those, when twins have a connection or something like this. Totally. There's maybe something there. I don't know what it yeah. is, but yeah, um, you talk about denying people a clean ending to your story. What do you mean by that? I was approached to write this book um, based on an article that I wrote for Flair and it was a mucky muck agent who worked with fancy publishers and all of them rejected my, they loved the idea and then rejected my manuscript because they wanted a clean story or either first there was, we're already publishing a woman's story next year to which like, let's have that conversation of like, we get one a year. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. And this was like around me to go messy. So it's like, no, like people were hungry for women's stories. Yeah. So like, that's weird. So it was either that or it was, Oh, we like the story. We don't want the feminism. Um, and it was, but, I, and that's the trend that we see in story after story after story. And it's no shade at other survivors. Cause I get it, but it's really a narrative that people like, which is like something horrific happened to me. Um, then, you know, I overcame it. I got sober. I found Jesus. I did this. And now my life is wonderful and I wouldn't change a thing. And it's made me who I am. And then, and that's not true to to my experience. And it's not true to the vast majority of the women that I've worked with. And that's thousands of women over the years. And so I can't tell that story um, because one, it's not authentic Two, I don't think it's helpful to other survivors because it pits them and says like, well, Julie did it. So what's your excuse? Um, And it is messy. Like healing is a lifelong process in a lot of ways. It's certainly not linear. And I think Sometimes I wonder like, oh, should I be talking about it when I don't haven't gotten to a place where I'm completely healed? But I think it's actually more honest to to be realistic in saying, I don't know what the ending is to my story. I don't know the day that I'll stop thinking about it. I don't know the day that I'll almost forget what happened to me. That day may come. That day may never come. And I think putting that out into the world uh, is important to me. Uh, And I think it's authentic. And I... I am so comforted to have been reached like so many survivors have reached out to me to say that they loved that so much that it gave them the freedom to talk about the messiness of healing. So that that idea that just because your abuser and stalker died, that you should be have an overwhelming flood of relief and then it's just over. That's just it's not reality. Right. I mean, just because they're gone, it doesn't mean the last 10 years of garbage aren't still with you right yeah absolutely and the fact that it's very easy for people to say like oh your problems are done now because xavier's dead it's like okay but now i have you know half a million complete strangers that are telling me that they're going to kill me i still have to send my mail to a p.o box i still pay my bills in a fake name all the things i did to protect myself in the years of xavier i still have to do in order to have this career so you know, as we say in French, like, c'est bien bon to say, like, in my head, I intellectually understand that Xavier is dead. I completely understand that. But your, like, n- your body doesn't, your physiology hasn't figured that out. Your shoulders are still tense. You still have to watch over your shoulders. Like, I have to do those things if I want to continue to do this work. So it's really hard to kind of have, like, a holistic understanding that it's done because my body's like, no, girl, we have to be on high alert. Um, and that's just like literally that's just what i have to do if i want to keep doing this work so it's not to say i'm a like a martyr but it's just to say it's it complicates the hell out of it when my day-to-day life hasn't changed that much Mm -hmm. since his death yeah yeah and 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 that i i know you talk in the book quite a bit about you know once he died you know having a little celebration with your friends to help you deal with that and it it made me think of with kobe bryant you Mm -hmm. know passing away recently and for those who don't know he's a very famous basketball player 
who you know, raped a, a, a woman, you know, while he was married with uh, with kids years ago. Um, you know, he, he went on to do really wonderful things in his life for you know women, his family, for basketball, all sorts of stuff. And when he died, there was a lot of emphasis on that, but there was also a pushback by some people to say, "Look, he was also he was not a saint. He he did some awful things." And I know that anyone who said that was subject to a great deal of abuse. So there's this concept of you can't speak ill of the dead. Mm-hmm. And, and that's something that you tackle in the book. And, and what are your thoughts on that with respect to your situation and just in general, be it Kobe Bryant or anyone else? I am agnostic. So I fundamentally believe that like what lives on after you die is your legacy um, and the work that you've done and and all of the complexity of that. And I think we dehumanize someone like Kobe Bryant when we erase all of the bad and focus on the good. Uh, And it's ironic to me that I got so many heinous, violent, terrifying, legitimate threats to my life for saying like, hey, don't forget, Kobe's a lot of things, including a rapist. When, you know, the same world that I live in is also confused as to why I I try really hard to humanize Xavier, why I didn't want him, that I'm not happy that he's dead, you know, like, it's a weird space that I occupy where I'm like, hey, let's complicate the fact that, like, I'm not super happy that my abuser's dead and people are like, well, that's dumb. And then I'm like, hey, let's call, like, so I don't think we as a culture really, I think we're wrestling with legacy and the concept of, yeah, your death and what that does or, um, you know, how we should remember you. And I think it's, it's a growing pain for our culture right now. Um, you know, even in cases where people aren't dead, right? Like Cosby, we're all, everyone's sort of like, what do we do with Cosby? You know, Michael Jackson, like there's so many examples. Um, but you know, the same world in which I'm told like me too has changed everything. It's like, okay, well, Roman Polanski just won an award a week ago. So like, what's that about? Um, and yeah, Kobe Bryant cared about women. Absolutely. In many ways, women that belong to him at least, you know, but he, legally apologize for raping somebody like these are not allegations right and Mm -hmm. and who are we to erase that um and survivors are always listening and that's really what i come down to a hundred percent of the time is like women and girls and men and boys and trans folks who've been impacted by violence listen to what we're saying when it comes to the issue and if and when it's trendy to talk about i believe survivors you're there but the second it's someone that you liked who committed that crime all of a sudden it complicates things for you it's like okay well then your support has a caveat and my support doesn't have a caveat. It's universal across the board. And if I'm going to keep being punished for that, then like, so be it. Um, but people are flawed. And I think we actually do them a disservice by acting as though, you know, Xavier dying wiped him of all his sins. Um, and people, yeah, people have a lot of feelings about speaking ill of the dead. And I experienced that with Xavier's death, but also, yeah, I was reminded this year with Kobe. Mm-hmm. Like, ooh, yeah, no, that's a touchy one for folks. Yeah. So your work to end violence against women has gone beyond the training and consulting you offer. You've also created some very tangible resources, such as Hollaback Ottawa, Draw the Line, and Outside of the Shadows. Can you tell us a bit about these and and how they can support people who need that support? Yeah, so um, Outside of the Shadows is a five-minute film that you can watch on YouTube, uh, and then there's a French version as well. And it's a it's a PSA on stalking. So I very briefly tell my story just to paint a picture. And then um, there's tips for survivors, like practical things that I learned that are helpful logistically. Uh, and then how to support someone, things to say, not say. Um, and that was a film that I created with an artist out of Montreal named Ambivalently Yours. It's over 100 hand-painted watercolors that have been stitched together. It's stunning. And that's mm-hmm. all because of her. Um Hollaback. This is our 10th anniversary this year, which is hey, very exciting. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Uh, so Hollaback, we have, we do work to end street harassment. If you take public transit in Ottawa and you've seen ads of like, if you feel harassed, if you've ever used the anonymous reporting mechanism, that's all us. We lobbied for years for OC to do that. Um, so if you want to learn more about how to be a good bystander, our website is chock full of resources on bystander intervention. So you can check that out. Um, and if you experience street harassment in Ottawa and you want it to be documented, you can download our app for free or go on our website, share your story, and a little dot goes on the map. And we actually track where street harassment happens in the city, which is really cool. That's great. And that data is what we use to push OC Transpo to care about harassment. So that it has a tangible uh, policy implication when you tell your story. 
and draw the line as uh, draw dash the dash line dot ca um, is currently, but we don't know for how long, funded by the province of Ontario. So it came into place in 2012 and it's a buy center intervention campaign that uses scenarios like uh, your wasted friend sags out of the bar with some guy. Do you stay and keep dancing? Someone shares you someone else's nudes. Do you share it with someone else? Um, so they're really super accessible scenarios um, that cover everything from workplace harassment to things that happen in the schoolyard to violence against trans folks, Indigenous women, people with disabilities, deaf women. Um, and it's all free to download off of the website. So, um, yeah, bystander intervention is really my passion. Um, and knowing that most people who experience violence are not going to access a legal system. Mm -hmm. So as a community, we have to be equipped to respond. So you're launching your book on Wednesday, March 11th at the Ottawa Writers Festival. Mm -hmm. So I believe your appearance is already sold out. But for those going, what can they expect? Well, I was assured by the folks at Writers Fest that if you show up, they will try to find room for you. So um, if you didn't get a ticket, it's still worth coming out. And I would love to see your face. Um, I'm being interviewed by Lucy Van Olden Barneveld, who is lovely. Um, so that makes it a little less... Uh, scary for me to have to just read a book and listen to people asking questions um but my hope is that we have that yeah i just leave people with a more nuanced understanding of what trauma is um i get a lot of questions about the title of my book uh, a lot of people who work in social justice -y f fields are a bit like ooh, because resilience is a concept that you know we we love a lot um, so to put it out there kind of bluntly as it being a futile exercise is like, woo. so hoping to talk a bit about that, um, and just leave people feeling like they're not alone, that if they either had this happen to them or if they just have complicated feelings about accountability and, uh, about healing and all, any of that stuff that like, I'm here to create that space. Mm, excellent. So where can people buy the book if they'd like to? You can buy it absolutely anywhere. So it's now available uh, anywhere in North America. So you want to go to Chapters, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. But if you want to go and get it in person easier and support independent bookstores, which I highly recommend you do, um, I would say Octopus Books or Perfect Books both have it on display in the window. So it's mm -hmm. easy to find. Um, and they're also um, just huge supporters of women's stories and would never once say, uh, we are only publishing one woman's story this year, so that's right. <laughs> so throw them some love. <laughs> Listen, I I think this is um, a really important book, a really well written book. Um, I feel weird saying it's a great book because it, you know it's yeah, it's people, not. It, people it's, are like, I don't know how to pay the compliment. I, yeah, <laughs> but it's it's really well written, and I, I definitely and it's, it's not a long read either. So I would encourage people to to check this out and then and go check out your launch. And congratulations again on this. Thank you so much for having me.